Mr. Caleb Taylor, I'm so glad to have you with us today, man. It's a, a, an honor to be uh, interviewing you today. No, sir. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Man, uh, I, I was in the office this morning and I sent you a message and I was like, hey, are you on Eastern time? <laughs> this is where I'm at. I'm in uh, Central time. And, uh, you know, you're in Georgia. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, what part of Georgia are you in? Right now, Villa Rica. We We also just moved. So that's, yes, sir. That's that's pretty awesome. Okay. Well, tell me where that is in relation, let's say, to Atlanta. It's about 30 minutes, 30, 45 minutes outside of Atlanta, west of Atlanta. Okay. Now, you uh, you work at uh, car auctions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. On a regular yes, basis. Sir. Are the car auctions that you work for in Atlanta or are they in a different area? So there is one in Cartersville and then there's one in Birmingham. So there, so the one on Cartersville is on Friday. The one in Birmingham is on Wednesdays. And because of school, I've, I really haven't been able to work those auctions. So that's, mm -hmm. it's really had me down a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of taking a back seat, you know, Hey, school's important. Okay. Well, I, I kind of, we kind of dive in, dove in the deep end here at the very beginning. So why don't we just kind of take a step back and have you tell us a little bit about yourself. I, I'm 99% sure that most people who are listening to this or watching this have some idea of who you are because you just won the biggest contest in the world for your age group. You know, that's, that's not nothing. Okay. So tell us, uh, tell us who you are, tell us how old you are. Um, tell us what, a day in the life of Caleb Taylor looks like. So uh, I'm 16 years old. So right now it's just it's school, school, school. Mm -hmm. But um, but what year I, I got it, sir. What year are you in school? Junior. I'm a junior. Very good. Yes, sir. So um, my father he he buys and sells cars. That's really all he does. And uh, one day he let me tag along with him to go to the auctions, and I I was fascinated by by what these guys were doing. I'm like the art of it. And so I had went home that night and I started finding videos. Matter of fact, it was your video. It was, um, it was your videos on, you know, how to auctioneer. I, I think it might've been called better. Bid call, I believe mm -hmm. it was, um, Blake balls, auction syndicate stuff. And then that's just what I, every single day. It was just, I was just watching videos just, and oof, it, it was rough. I'll be honest with you. It was, it was rough for the first, I think year of it. It was, it was, it was difficult. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I actually taught at the Nashville Auction School yesterday. So we're wow. recording this on August, what day is today? The 23rd. So August 22nd, I taught at Nashville Auction School, taught a two-hour course on bid calling. And all the students, you know, they're all like, man, I just can't get it. I just can't get it. And I, you just have to tell them, like, it'll come, you know, a year maybe, two years. I've been doing this thing for – I mean, goodness, I'm like you, you know, my dad was an auctioneer, so I grew up in the industry, right? So I've been doing this for 31 years. Um, wow. At, at, well, not professionally, you know, but I've been doing it professionally for 13. And oh. I still change my chant, you know, I, I still have things that I want to improve on. So very good uh, for you to to, to have grown and, and continue to climb and develop your chant. That's, that's very good. What do you want to do after high school? Go straight to auctioneer. Okay. Uh, go to auction school, and then just just hit the ground running. That's 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 my goal. It's my okay. dream right now. Okay. Um, do you have any auction schools in mind that are attractive to you? Uh, yes, sir. Worldwide, really. That's mm -hmm. that's the big one. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Yeah, great program, great instructors. Um, you you would not you would not be disappointed by going to worldwide. I will just tell you, Nashville is closer. You know, that that might be that might be something. Well, I'm just kidding. Worldwide is great. There are so many great auction schools. So I'm that's good. That's good that you have a plan. Um, I, I want to know. So you said that your dad was uh, or is a car buyer. Is that correct? Yes, sir. OK, so you got started in the auction business because of your dad. Yes, sir. Is that correct? 
I think that story is probably true for 99% of auctioneers. We get started because our fathers or mothers were in the auction business, were auctioneers of some kind, or they drug us to the local auction or whatever the case may be. So my question to you, Caleb, is if your dad worked as a buyer, what was attractive about the bid caller? You know, why not why not learn the game of being a buyer? My dad asked me a very similar question um, because it's, it's different. Auctioneer, you don't, of course you see a, a lot of auctioneers. Of course, it's a big community, but it, it's, it's, it's not your, your average, your everyday type job. Like it's, you don't see an auctioneer every day. And then when you tell people, oh, I'm an auctioneer, you're like, oh, wow, okay. And, and of course, anybody can buy and sell cars. But I think the biggest thing that, that really attracted me was you, you, you can never get bored auctioneer and whether it's the auctions that you work at or changing your channel or something, but it's, it's, it's never a dull moment when you're auctioneer. So that, that stood out to me. Oh, I love that answer. That's a great answer. Yeah. I mean, the auction industry itself, let alone bid calling, but the auction industry as a whole is constantly changing, right? There are just, there are things that happen all the time. And when you're behind the microphone, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, it's right. you never know what you're going to see um, as an item or just an experience. I mean, you might have, I mean, you sell cars, right? So you might have a car come in. You think, well, this is probably worth somewhere around $5,000. And it winds up bringing, you know, $25,000. And then you turn to the guy beside you and you're like, what was special about that thing? But you you learn, right? It's a whole whole experience. So, Caleb, you got into this because of your dad. Your dad is in the car business. Uh, have you had experience selling any other commodities, any other uh, items besides cars, or is that basically all you've done so far? Cars is the main thing, but uh, I, I, right now I've worked one estate, one estate sale as a Raymon mm -hmm. uh, with my or Jason, Jason Brooks. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's interesting. Just like you said, you never know what new waters are going to come in, but really mostly cars. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, have you worked as a ringman in the yes, car sir. auction? Yeah, you probably that's started as a ringman. Yes, sir. And, and even right now, mostly because I don't have my license, that's really mostly what I can do is just be a ringman and then fill in um, if an auctioneer is out or at the end of the lane, if it's like some reruns or something, then, then I can get up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell us, tell us something about being a ringman that most people either don't know or they have a wrong idea of. Teach us something about being a ringman. I'll say this. I know most people, when they look at being a ringman, they think it's – you know, I guess l below their pay grade and being a ringman is it's just as important as being the auctioneer. Now the auctioneer has the final say at everything, but, but that ringman can make a, a, a $5,000 difference. Like that ringman is night, night and day difference. Mm -hmm. And, but and if that auctioneer and that ringman don't have chemistry, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a rough sale. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important word is uh, chemistry. Because not everyone can work together. Right. And, and I don't mean that not everyone can work together in the sense that not everyone can do good things or, you know, make money. I mean, not everyone's personalities blend together. Yes. That's sir. not always a bad thing. You know, it, so if you're going to do the, the Ringman deal, you got to have a bid caller you can work with that you can signal to, you know, you, you know the game. So, yes. So uh, you work as a ringman for the most part and uh, get a little bid calling at the end or whatever. Uh, who has been maybe uh, really influential in your life as an auctioneer? Because you have, I mean, you're 16 years old. You have a very developed chant. I mean, as, as obvious by your uh, recent accolades. But uh, have, you, have you worked with somebody? Has, have you been trained by someone? 
Um, I've been trained by Jason Brooks and Dustin Taylor, yes, sir. Okay. And, um, and also on top of that, but I've just I've tried to watch a plethora of auctioneers, mm-hmm. and because there's certain auctioneers that have charisma, they're like like um, Jason Brooks. He has inflection. He has really good inflection. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if you know Tommy Bellamy, but he brings like like his whole chain is just charismatic. Like that's all he has. Like his his personality. Like it just, and that's really awesome. So that's that's something that I've wanted to take. And add it to it to my auctioneering because that that charisma that energy level helps helps to get stuff sold, sure. and then ha- not having one same one little uh, a vocal point or, or vocal level, uh, you know, having your inflection is that you you you're keeping your uh, your audience awake and you're keeping them alert and you're keeping them bidding and that's important too. But it, it's it's been a, a wide range of auctioneers that I've just I've watched just to learn from them, find one little nugget from each of these auctioneers and blend it together, put that in my chant. Mm-hmm. Very good. So let me ask you uh, about contests. So most of what we do on Better Bid Calling and the podcast is, of course, we talk about the auction industry, but we also talk about contests because most people who watch this and listen to this are competitive auctioneers who want to improve. And uh, I've had the privilege of watching you uh, at at Mule Day. I judged you at Mule Day. It's one of the, you're one of the easiest ones to judge. You know, there's very little that we could pick apart on your run. It was very well done. Of course, you had some stiff competition at Mule Day. There were some, in that junior division, there were some, some humdingers of some bid callers, which is wonderful. You know, that's that's great. I, Jack, I watched your run. Very well done, of course, as is evident by your hardware that came as a result of that. I, I didn't get to see you at Bluegrass. I'm normally at the Bluegrass competing, but I wasn't able to go this year. Um, so let's talk contest. Was Mule Day your first contest or had you competed before? Mule Day was my first. My first was contest. it really? Okay. Yes, sir. So let's talk about that. What led you to want to compete? I, I really do hate to sound done at this part, but it was my father. So after about my first year of wanting to be an auctioneer and everything, I got discouraged, you know, school and everything. But um, I got discouraged because there, there really wasn't, in my opinion, there wasn't a lot to do. You know, just I mean, I can watch other people, I can practice, but there, there's no, there's no really a lot of application or room for application. But my father was the one that pushed me uh, to email Callie Crisp of of the mm-hmm. um, association of the auctioneers associations and to see if there were any junior contests. So I emailed her, and she said, "Yeah, there's three contests, and there's one in April." And this was like two months beforehand. I, I believe it was two months beforehand, and I was like. Okay, so dad, are we going to this? And he was like, y- you need to go. So, yes, sir. And we went, and the rest is history. Yeah, that's great. How did you, how did you prepare? Did you prepare? Or did you just show up on, on the day and just kind of wing it? I mean, knowing what I know about you, I would imagine that you had some kind of prep going on. But so, what did you do? Uh, it, it was, I believe, a five hour, five or six hour. I don't know. It was, it was maybe a four or five hour car ride up there. Mm-hmm. And the whole while I was either asleep or I was auctioneering. And of course, of course you know, I, I try to get in an hour a day of auctioneering every day, whether it's me going to school. Um, I live about 30 minutes from my school. So 30 minutes going to school, 30 minutes coming back and just auctioneer, auctioneer, sell cars or whatever. And then even while I'm driving, I'm like, okay, I can slow down or I can not say this or I can, okay, put this in here instead of this. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, the, it's the little things, certain little things that I need to pick apart simply in my everyday life. I'm, I might be um, doing something, doing something around the house. Okay, I'm, I'm auctioneered. Ooh, that world doesn't sound right. And so it, in my opinion, just a little bit of that preparation every single day, it, it, it keeps my mind fresh. And so when it, when it is time for me to compete in those competitions, I can say, oh, okay, I need to slow down or maybe, maybe I can speed up a little bit, but I'm not clear. So maybe it's best to just stay here. That's, that's what I do. Yeah, very good. Do you, do you ever practice your introduction, your item description? You know, do you have a system of, of going over those things? And if so, what does it look like? Yes, sir. So uh, it might be an everyday item sitting on the counter, and I'll say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Caleb Taylor, your contestant number one, uh, making my home in Villarica, Georgia. 
And uh, this is my this is my first item, and usually it's not that I don't, I don't terrible, but mm -hmm. I, I don't like to say uh a lot in my introduction. Right, right. But do, doing that also, I, I do that all the time, and then and, and I, I I try to work on my inflection. I, I try to come up and sound excited. I try to have a smile on my face. I've heard that's a big one. If you smile, that 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 really yes. makes the or helps the the audience to bid, and that it's just little things that I, I do like that just all the time. Yeah, I told the class yesterday, enthusiasm and a smile will sell more than a good chant. Yes, and I, I believe it. I really do. I mean, try to have a good chant. But, you know, I mean, people need to know that you're excited, right? So what we did yesterday, I'll just tell you, what we did yesterday in class, this was day six for them. So they've had six days of auction law, different kind of auctions, you know, auction set up taxes, you know, all this stuff that gives you a big headache. And then at the end of the day, they've had bid calling practice. So they've had six days of bid calling practice. There's not much that I can tell them that they haven't heard a thousand times before by that point. Right, right. So all we did for an hour was go over how do you start your bid calling chant? How do you go from an item description into the actual chant? For people like you who sell cars, you never break your rhythm. Right. Right. I mean, it's your enthusiasm, your rhythm. It's always there. If you have a 2020 Escalade come in the ring or, you know, or come in the lane, it's uh, all right. Next line is a 2020 Escalade. Let's go. I mean, it's just boom, boom, boom. Constant. That's right. Fast You've, yeah. It's fast paced. You got to keep that rhythm, keep that enthusiasm. Your introduction becomes part of your chant. Okay, so when I was telling that to them, they were like, oh, well, we just thought you'd get up and kind of give a polished public speech and you have to say everything about the item and then you start your chant. Well, there's no transition there, right? And so we were, I'll get to the main point. The main point was, I want to know when you start describing that item, even if it's just saying a 2020 Escalade and that's all you're going to say, when you describe that item, I want to know that you're excited about it, right? Because you're going to sound excited in your chant. So right. just I'm basically just agreeing with you that enthusiasm and a smile will get you more dollars at the end of the day than just about anything else. Because you're a salesman. Okay. You're a salesman. Yeah. So, Caleb, let's get back to talking about contests. Um, you went to Mule Day. There were, I don't remember, maybe five, six, seven, eight contestants in the junior contest. I believe seven or eight. Yeah, seven or eight, maybe maybe more. I, I really don't remember. I, if I sat down and counted, I could probably come up with it. The That was the first year that uh, Mule Day has had a junior contest. So that was that was interesting for you to be in on the ground floor. And you're the inaugural champion of that. Um, yeah, yeah. So then you you didn't compete from Yule Day to the IJAC. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So Mule Day is a great contest. I'm a past Mule Day champion. I love Mule Day, and uh, it is by far my favorite contest. Uh, unapologetically, my favorite contest. Yes, sir. It's very fun. It's a it's a premier contest. It's a United States wide contest. Anybody can can compete, but it's not the IAC. There's no right. interview portion. It's in a sale barn. It's in a livestock barn. You know the the vibe is very relaxed at Mule Day. At least I don't know if you felt that way, but I've always felt that way. So, tell, I mean, I don't remember if you wore a cowboy hat or not, Like, but most people do. So, how how does Mule Day compare to something like the IJAC? Mule Day. Mm. No, I don't want to say that, but uh, I think Mule Day, it is a, it is a lot more contestants – that have a uh, a more developed chant mm. or, a, or a more rhythmic chant. Mm. Uh, just basically, 
Yeah, I, I would say more big chat. Whereas the whereas the IJAC, it's not it's not just about bid calling. Uh, uh, that's, that's that's what I'm trying to get to. When you go to Mule Day and battle the bluegrass, it's about bid calling. Right. That's it. Right. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, when you go to the to the uh, IJAC to the IAC, they want an ambassador. That's mm-hmm. really what they're looking for. So your chan- you can have the best chan ever, but if you fail in your public speaking or your interview, then that's going to turn back on the NAA and make it, it really give off a, a poor image of the NAA. So they they not only want to, of course, have a great chant, like you said, but but the interview part that's very very important too. That interview that's a, that's a bit. I think it was forty percent of my overall score, and that I was like, whoa, that was. Man. And then also when when you go to um, the IAC, uh, they they look for effective auctioneering. So if I'm going 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, now I need to go from 100 to quarters. I, I need to switch my bid increments. Mm-hmm. Whereas at Mule Day or Battle of the Blue, Bluegrass, you could stay in the same increment. I mean, I, you know, it might count a little bit against you, but it, it, it won't do enough to, to change your, your overall score significantly. Whereas at the, at the uh, IAC, at the IJAC, it will. Mm-hmm. It, it will change your score heavily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one thing that the uh, IJAC, IAC judges really look for is how do you how do you work your item, and your number increments are part of that. You know, so if I'm going by two and a halves, let's say, and I go from two and a half to twenty five, when I hit twenty five, you better be bumping to fives. You know, you have added <laughs> enough value to the item that you don't need to waste your time with two and a halves anymore. Right. And then if you take from 25 and you get to 50, maybe you bump it by tens. I mean, there's no you have to continue with the value in the suggested incremental increase based on what your bidders are doing. Right. So that's a really good observation. Well, let me ask you about the interview. Uh, Did you know that the IJAC had an interview? I did. And I was, I, of course, I pre- I prepared a little speech for it and everything. And when I got on stage and I was and I was presenting, my, I was I was nervous. My hands were sweaty. I, I think I was shaking that interview. It is it, because you're you're in a big. It, it was really it was really nerve wracking because you were in a big room like this. This is this is like a ballroom, and you were like, you have to give. And again, and they'll give you the question. Of course, you have time to think about your answer, but you cannot afford to get up there to freeze and to freeze up and to get nervous and everything. And, and I think one of the mistakes I made really in that in that interview was I said, um, I said, with that being said, I think I said that like five different times. And I had gone back to watch it. I was like, what in the world? What am I? Wow, like what am I saying? Why did I say it five times? But yes, sir, that interview, it's it's a different ball game. Yeah, it is. Uh, I was actually on the phone yesterday with a guy. Uh, I'll, I'll leave his name out. Wonderful, wonderful bid caller, wonderful auction competitor, wonderful interviewer uh, when the interview portion comes up. And he said, man, I just my interview this year just was not what I wanted it to be. Um, but I think sometimes we run the risk of trying to think about what everybody else wants to hear rather than what our genuine answer might be. Yes, sir. Definitely. We're we're not, we're not listening to the question. We're trying to formulate an answer in our head before the question is even read. We try to second guess the question and, and say, well, what, well, who are the judges? What would this judge say to this question? Well, I'm going to say what that judge would say. You know, that's not how you do an interview. An interview is your moment to give your opinion. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You know, you don't win. Okay. Okay. But you were honest, right? You were genuine. And that, as, as a judge, if I'm, if I'm judging an interview, that's what I'm looking for. You know, I'm looking for someone. I, we can disagree all day long. If I ask you, Caleb, if I ask you, do you think that so – I'll give you an example. In Tennessee, my understanding right now is that you do not have to have an auctioneer's license to conduct online-only auctions. Okay, that, that's my understanding. Those of you who are listening who are from Tennessee can correct me if I'm wrong. But even if I am wrong, let's just take it as a as a possibility. Okay. If I was to ask you in a contest, do you believe that you should have a, a Tennessee license 
Tennessee auctioneer's license in order to conduct an online auction, and you say no, we disagree. But I want to know why you said no. And I want to know, can you make an argument for your point that would be persuasive? Okay, I can care less if we agree. I just want to know if you can be genuine in your argument. And I, I do think sometimes, like what you said with saying things over and over again, uh, or saying things like, like I said, or even saying, um, or, uh, those are not, that's not kryptonite to Superman. You know, at the end of the day, that shows that you're a person. It shows that you're a genuine person who's conversational. So I wouldn't worry too much about that moving into the future. I know you didn't ask my opinion, but there it is. So the, I I do the, the IJAC, do you remember how many contestants were in the IJAC? I think seven or ten in total. Okay. Okay. See, I think that's growing. I think yeah. the junior contests are really growing. Um, do you go to a public school, Caleb? No, sir. I go to a private school. Okay. Okay. The reason I ask is because I was going to ask if y'all had an FFA chapter at your school. Uh, the the FFA in Oklahoma and now in Tennessee, I believe, are starting auction contests. So that's that's become a really really Oklahoma is doing it big, man. You should go check it check it out sometime on Facebook. The Oklahoma uh, Association they they're doing contests for FFA members, and it's turning out to be a really really good thing. So long story longer. These junior contests that you are now an ambassador for. I mean, as an IJAC champion, Mule Day Junior Champion, Battle of Bluegrass. We'll talk about Bluegrass in just a minute. You're an ambassador for this. Yes, sir. Why should someone who does not have an auctioneer's license, who doesn't get paid to bid call, but who enjoys the art and has taught themselves a chant or somebody has worked with them and taught them a chant, or maybe they ring a couple of sales. Why should somebody enter a junior contest? To For two reasons. First, to get the experience. And once you get the experience and once you grow, if you do end up pursuing this, uh, this has a career, if you end up pursuing auctioneer, if you get your auctioneer's license, you already have experience uh, under your belt. So now... Not only that, but people also know you. It's also for exposure. It's for experience and it's for exposure. But once you get that exposure, people know you. So especially if it's somewhere local, once, once I turn 18 or once somebody turns 18 and gets their auctioneer's license, people are going to say, oh, that guy I know, but that guy competed. That guy, has a, that guy is polished or, okay, I can, I can mentor this guy. I can I can show this guy some some tricks on how to succeed. So you you already come in ahead of the uh, ahead of the game because of, of what you did in your youth. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. I think that's I think that's true. Um, I think a lot of people, especially with the auction profession, like as a bid caller, they have this idea of well, I can learn that later. Yeah. You know, yes, sir. I, I'll I'll do what I need to do now. I'll take care of myself now, and I'll just do that later. And then later comes, and I see it all the time in auction schools. You've learned bad habits by then. You know, uh, one thing that I love about auction contests is the feedback that you get from your fellow competitors. Yes. So I, I'm sure this has happened to you. It's happened to me in every contest that I'm in. Uh, you know, I tell the story quite often. I, I did a WLAC quarterfinal and it was terrible. I had a terrible run. Um, 52 contestants. I think I was 20th or 21st or something like that in the contest. And uh, which wasn't terrible because the 10 ahead of me had been to the finals before. So I didn't feel too bad, but it wasn't a good run. And uh, I just bring this story up because it wasn't a good run. And on the way home, from this contest, I had like a 10 hour drive from Missouri and uh, I get a call from a friend of mine who is a livestock auctioneer and he had competed in that contest. And he was like, dude, what the heck was that? 
I'm like, hey, man, come, come on now. Give me a break. He's like, no, you're better than that. And he worked with me on it. So the, the camaraderie that you get from contests, I think, is a wonderful thing. Like you with these junior contests, because there's only about 10, you know, eight or 10 of y'all competing on a regular basis. Right. You're probably friends with them now, aren't you? Yes, sir. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Well, let's talk about bluegrass. Tell me about that. How'd that come into your line of sight? And uh, what was that like? After uh, I Jack, Mrs. Callie, she said, you should go to uh, bluegrass and uh, try to win the triple crown. But from everything that I had heard about bluegrass, I was like, I'm not going to bluegrass. But uh yeah, uh, after after some a, after a, a lot of consideration, after a lot of prayer, really, uh, I was like, okay, uh, bluegrass. I, I think I should go to it. It it really for the belt buckle. Like I like I I love competing in contests with belt buckles. Sure, not, and I every time. So I was like, okay, let's let's go do it. So I went up there, and. Um, it was it was amazing. Like we 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 drove up there. We drove six hours up there. That was just beautiful, beautiful farmland. And we got up there, and everybody is just talking. Everybody's friends with everybody. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is going to be pretty good. And then the next day comes around, and it's it's my run, and I, and I I don't think I did that great on my run. I mean, there was hardly anybody bidding. It, it was maybe two or three bidders the whole time, and, and I was like. Okay, all right. That was that's interesting. So it kind of made me a little nervous, and, and I, I tried my best not to get ahead of myself or or try to start uh, becoming nervous or having having a I want to say a breakdown or whatever. But I, I guess the the whatever is below a breakdown, I, I didn't want to get to that level because that was whew, that was that was scary. So you get on stage and uh, you're you're ready for your run. Battle of the Bluegrass is is an interesting contest. It's the only one that I'm aware of. You'll have to remind me about IJAC. It's the only one I'm aware of that where you have ringmen. Do you have ringmen at, in the IJAC? Yes, sir, we do. At, okay, in do. IJAC. Okay. I kind of wondered because it's such a big venue. I mean, you'd almost have to. Yes, sir. So, uh, Mule Day, you don't have ringmen. Uh, state contest. For the most part, you don't have ringmen. I think Kentucky might actually supply you with ringmen. They, they do, actually, that supply you with ringmen. But Tennessee, we don't. Um, Alabama, Georgia, I don't think let you use ringmen. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, so, but, but Bluegrass is, is – Bluegrass is her own little breed. You know, she they, – they, uh, they give you ringmen, and the ringmen are good. Don't get me wrong. The, the ringmen are great. Alex Popperwool is one of them. He's a friend, a um, friend of mine, and – he actually just sold, I don't know if you saw this or not, but he sold the the champion ham at the Kentucky State Fair for ten and a half million dollars. I was like, wow. I yes. was like, yes. Ham. I was like, okay, wow. Yeah. You about hate to eat something like that for ten and a <laughs> half million dollars. So, okay, let me get back on track. How did you like working with Ringman in a contest? Working with Ringman. Um, of, of course, I have a. I think I, I have a greater appreciation for. It. I, I think that once you, if you work as a ringman, uh, and then you want to transition to the auctioneer side of it, you are going to have such a great appreciation for those ringmen, because those guys are on the fire. I mean, they, they are they are the first defense. Um, but it was to. I mean, to me, it, it was it was normal. But every ringman is different. Every ringman is is always different, and that's something that I've learned. And that I've had to learn, and that I've been told. And so, getting up there, of course, one thing I want to do was, you know, talk. Uh, I, I talked to Mr. Alex, uh, Mrs. Tammy, Mrs. Tammy Wells. She, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to her before I got up there, but that just it, it uh, makes everything a little bit less tense, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But it, it, to me, it was just you know the average walk in the park. I was just like, wow, yes, because like for me, not having a ring is a little, is a little scary. Uh, not having a ringman. Having a ringman, it's just like, okay, all right, I, I can kind of, I can breathe a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you have another layer of defense, like you said. You know, if you miss somebody, maybe they won't, and and you'll yes, yes. you'll be able to be in. Yeah, very good. Yeah, the the ringman deal with contest is is tricky for me. Um, 
I am so used to competing without Ringman that, really? yeah, yeah. Most of the contests that I've been in besides bluegrass, uh, it's actually in the rules that you cannot have a Ringman. Um, so we'll give you an example. The year that I was the reigning champion for the Tennessee Auction Association or Auctioneers Association, I was the MC for next year's contest. So I, I go to the contest, I'm reading out the contestants, you know, reading sponsors, doing fill-in stuff and all this mess. And then we would have guys get up to compete and we would have people in the audience taking bids, like trying to serve the role of the ringman. And, and there were multiple times where I had to say, you know, like in between competitors, ladies and gentlemen, this is a contest. Uh, we want to raise all the money we can for the association, but at the end of the day, these individuals are responsible for taking their own bids. Please refrain from taking bids for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's hard to do because you don't want to come across as a jerk and they're trying to help. Um, but it's in the rule book. You know, it's in the rules for that contest. And if you're going to be fair, you have to abide by the rules. Now, Battle of the Bluegrass, you've got really good ringmen. Um, I was going to ask you something else about bluegrass. Do you remember what items you brought to the contest for that one? I brought um, wood centerpieces, um, uh, decorations, and then I brought a, a garden owl sculpture. Okay. Yes, sir. So you said that just a couple of people were bidding, but how was the crowd? Was there a, a pretty good crowd for that? I think, I think it, was, it was a decent sized crowd. Yes, sir. So they have, it so. At the, they have it at the state fair, right? Yes. Still? Okay. Yeah, that's one thing that we had, let's see, obviously not this past year. The year before that, I went, um, got fourth that year, and uh, we had a huge crowd. We had maybe 200 people in the room, but they were all people from the state fair who had come in to watch, and they weren't really there to spend, right? So right. that's that's interesting. That, that's an interesting dynamic, and I think having it at the state fair – uh, for Davin when he listens to this is a good idea because it really promotes the auction industry. So appreciate Davin uh, Smith for all the work he does for that contest. I want to have him on one day. I've got a list of guests a mile long to get through, but Davin, I'm coming for you. Hang on. Yes, sir. Okay, Caleb, tell, tell me a little bit about what you're going to do as a representative of the NAA as the junior uh, champion. You know, I, I don't know how it is for you guys, but I, I know for a fact that for the male and, and female champion in the, in the IEC, they're obligated, right? They're like contractually obligated to travel to all so many associations and, you know, promote and this, that, and the other. Is that true for you guys? And if so, what does that look like? We didn't have to sign any contract um, that I'm aware of. Um, I'd be shocked if we did. <laughs> um, I think I think it, it was more of implied. Hey, you have to be an ambassador, um, and plus, just the champions before me were ambassadors. So I'm like, okay, I might as well just step into this role. Uh, to keep it broadly, one thing I want to do is really uh, expand the the, uh, the NAA Next Gen program, and it's growing. It really is. And and I and I love what those guys that Morgan Morgan Hops and she's doing a great job there. Mrs. Sarah Rose Bittner, those guys, uh, the, those ladies are doing an amazing, amazing job up there uh, with Next Gen. And what I want to do is come in and help. And one way that I'm doing that is by trying to start more junior auctioneer competitions um, in Georgia. We're actually doing one. I, I've, I've talked with the with the board about it with the Georgia Auctioneer Association board. And we're actually going to have a junior auctioneers, uh, associate, uh, junior auctioneers competition in October at our convention. It's going to be the right. first one. I'm, right. I'm really excited about, about that. But any way that I can encourage young auctioneers, because, of course, you can go and see these adults. You can, oh, well, I, you know, I, I wish I was doing that or, or I wish I could, uh, like I mentioned earlier, apply, just apply all that practice. Well, that's really what I want to do. And, of course, everybody can't travel to Georgia. But if, if maybe I could do something uh, or, or try to get something done in, in all the states, or not all the states, but in uh, a good bit of the states, 
or like you mentioned, FFA. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot about the FFA program, and that's one thing that I, I want to do is kind of pick up where Brandon Vallis left off and, mm. and you know, do my best with it with the NAA, try to uh, step in and help them with uh, the FFA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon is a good dude, man. Yes, I like sir. Brandon a lot. Um, I need to have him on too and, and pick his brain a little bit. Well, Caleb, as a 16 year old champion bid caller, for all of us, there is always room for improvement. Um, even even your international champion like Shane McCarroll. Shane's a friend, right? Uh, but I know Shane, and I know that when he went home after he had won the IAC, I know the first thing he did was probably ask his wife, what did I do wrong? You know what I mean? Like that's just the kind of guy Shane is. Uh, when Shane competed in, at Mule Day, I was a judge, and it's hard to judge your friends, man. Hard to judge your friends. He called me after the contest. He said, all right, let me have it. What I do wrong? Uh, so for you, you are so good. You have such a polished chant, and you're so you're so humble and professional. Um, so the, the question is not intended to sound like you like you need to do something. It's intended to be reflexive. So what are some things that you're working on in yourself right now? to improve not only your chant, but just you as an auctioneer or you as a person, you know, what are some things that you do to, to kind of build yourself? Well, the first thing is I try to step, I, I try to become more of a leader. Uh, but two, I, I'll go to my chant. I watched my IJAC run. And the first thing that I said, and the first thing that uh, one of my mentors, Dustin Taylor said, and one of the things John Nichols said, was slow down, and, and I, I think that's a big thing because yeah. after a certain point in my finals run, I had reached a point, and it's just like I had flipped a switch or something. I, I had just – I went crazy fast, and it's just – I th in my opinion, I should have slowed down and kept the clarity because uh, while I was trying to go – or get faster and speed up, I was risking clarity, and I risked a lot, a lot of clarity in that, um, in that risky move, in my opinion. So, but also just I'm, I'm trying to become a leader. I'm trying to ha have a servant's heart. I'm trying to do more. That's yes, sir. That's that's really what I'm trying to do to just help myself to, uh, to be a light to others. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, it's evident. You know, it, it's uh, it's noticed by people. I mean, you and I, we, we've met, we've conversed, and this is the first time we've actually had an extended conversation, but it, it's it's noticeable that you're doing those things, that you are becoming a leader and that you are taking on that servant's heart, which is what a leader does. You know, a, a, leader, a, a leader is not someone who stands in front of people and tells them what to do. A leader is someone who shows people what to do and how to do it. And you're doing that. So that's, that's great. Well, Caleb, um, we got just a couple of minutes left here. And so what I do at the end of every episode is I have what I call rapid fire questions. Um, these, you can take as long as you want. I don't really care, but they're the same questions I ask everybody on every episode. So this is going to be fun uh, with you because you, you may not have an answer to some of these questions being in the situation that oh. you're in. Um, but, but you, but you, you might have some really interesting perspectives. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Caleb, what is the weirdest item that you've ever sold at auction? Recently that, that owl sculpture, that was, that was really, really weird. That was, was that the, at the estate sale that you were talking uh, about? No, sir. That was not actually one of the items that I took to battle the bluegrass. Oh, oh, and, oh. So you took they, it? Yes, sir. Well, where did it come I, from? Why did you take that? It came from Amazon. Uh, it was two $50 items. And so I'm, I'm searching $50 items, something that's nifty, I guess. And that pops up. Okay, bought it. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Um, well, let me ask you about, uh, the, the as a car auctioneer, what's your favorite car? Oh, there's so many options. Um, you have the same response that I would have if I was asked that question. I love cars, man. I love them. 
Yes, sir. There's just there's so many, but I think I think those old. I think a good two thousand or, or two thousand one Mustang, a GT. Come on, yeah. five zero. Yeah. Ooh, uh, but but a, a manual too. Oh my goodness, black. <laughs> black. I love it. I love it. That's a good one. Um, what's your go to filler word in your chant? Uh, either it's daughter now or bid it at. Or it's either I'm again, so uh, so I say I got a bid, see the bid, and then and then I'll say I get I get a bid to get a bid I'm again, and then and I I, I might say that I might throw that in my chant to kind of break it up or daughter now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you do tongue twisters on a regular basis? Yes, sir. Which it's, ones? I I do Betty Barter, uh, the the woodchuck. Uh -huh. That's really it. Um, but Sally sells seashells, and then I'll go back to Betty Barter, and they kind of throw Betty Botter in my channel a little bit too. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's Yep. Good deal. Let's see. Uh, when you sell cars, do you do, do y'all do the live simulcast? Do you have internet bidders that you're working with too? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Tell us about that. Tell us about uh, what that's like for you. Simulcast. It is very, very interesting because sometimes we'll have our sellers online too. Uh, it just it depends on the day, but our buyers, it's it's really good because those guys that that brings in so much more enthusiasm. And you're probably thinking, how does the internet bring in enthusiasm? But if I'm hung up, and by hung up I say I I, I have this person, I have this reserve I need to get to. This guy is not paying any more money. He's done. Well, I might I might throw one there. Guys, look at this car. Look at the grade on it. And then the internet might come in. And then another internet bidder, and then the guy that didn't want to get bid anymore is going to come back in, and he's going to bid a, a few more times. And so it's 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 thrilling. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's a lot to watch and a lot to keep up with. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I have I have sold one au two auctions that had live audience bidders and internet bidders, and so I don't do it very much. Um, but it, it is a lot. You got to have one eye on the crowd and one eye on the computer. And you got to have one more of a ringman who knows what they're doing. Yep. Yes. Yep. Good deal. Uh, Caleb, let's see. You already mentioned several of them, but I want to ask you again. Who are some auctioneers that you love to listen to? So these don't have to be anybody that you have any knowledge of or, you know, that are influential in your life. Just that if you're listening to auctioneers, they're they're ones that you really pay attention to. I like listening to Heath Spracklin. Of course, my mentors, Dustin Taylor and Jason Brooks. I like Tommy Bellamy. I, I love hearing him. Chuck Bradley. I like I like hearing Chuck Bradley. I like hearing Brandon and Neely. I like hearing you guy, you. I like hearing Ralph Wade and John Corey. I like hearing those guys for cattle. I like ha hearing those auto auctioneers for uh, for auto auctioneers, and then I'll I'll, I'll watch some ringman. I'll, I'll go back and watch past competitions of the ringman. I like I like watching Jesse Garber and Chris Elliott work. I like watching Dustin Taylor work. I, those guys, I, I love seeing them work as ringman. Yeah, yeah. That that's a really interesting response, and I'll tell you why. Because if you take the the list of auctioneers that you gave, you have what I would say uh, are tr the traditional car auctioneer sound. Uh, I, I'm I'm a firm believer that there's no such thing as a blank chant. So like there's no such thing as a car chant and a livestock chant. Your chant is your chant and you can use it for whatever you want. Um, but you you have guys who are car auctioneers who are also livestock auctioneers like Chuck Bradley and Brandon Neely. Yes. And their chants have some really good overlap uh, in the two. And then you've got guys like Ralph Wade. Like you said, Ralph Wade has one of the, as far as tempo goes, it's really slow. Ralph Wade has a slow chant, but it's so rhythmic and so smooth, right? So by listening to those, I imagine you're taking things from these two different extremes, okay? like the really rapid kind of higher pitch car sales, uh, car auction guy, and then the lower pitched, slower Ralph Wade's of the world and bringing them together. So all that to say those of you who are listening to this podcast, don't just get hung up on one auctioneer that you like. It's like ice cream. You got to try all the flavors. And sometimes. And, and, go oh, ahead. Sorry. 
I said, uh, what, one more auctioneer that I, I love to listen to is Shane Ratliff. Like Shane Ratliff, he, he, he actually has a little bit of a cattle chant sometimes, but not really, but he is rapid. It's just, it is crazy. It's crazy to hear Shane Ratliff auctioneer. He, I, I've not had the pleasure of meeting Shane. I hope to one day, but having listened to him, I'm not convinced that he's human. It, it, there is no way that the human mouth should be able to do what, what his does. It, it, it's, it's ungodly what he does. Um, but, but by listening to all these different guys, you, you're bringing in this amalgamation and, and you're learning what, what you like. And that's, that's part of the battle. Uh, Caleb, what's one piece of advice you would give to a brand new auctioneer? Uh, stay consistent. I'll say that. Stay consistent. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the first for the first year, I was oof, it, it was rough. It, it it was rough. It was rough auctioneering. But now, because I practice every day, because if you, if you stop me for a while, because there are times that I've stopped maybe uh, maybe a few days or maybe a week, and what has automatically happened is my whole chat might change, or I might I might forget something that I should have uh, already known. So just stay consistent because once you stay consistent, you could just build on the day before, just keep building and keep building. Very good. Very good. I love it. Uh, well, Caleb, we're, we're at the end. So one more thing before I let you go, would you mind selling me a car, please, sir? Yes, sir. I'll do it. Uh, let's, let's see. But matter of fact, let's, let's sell one of those GTs I was talking about earlier. I get a biscuit about how many games. Three grand. I get up thirty-two, four, six. I get up eight, four thousand. I get up forty-two. I get up four, six. I get up eight, five thousand. I get up five thousand. I get up two hundred. I get up four. I get up six hundred. I get up eight. I get up six hundred. I get up six thousand. I tell you, I get six hundred. I get up one. I get up two. I get up one, two. I get up three hundred. I get up four. I get up five, six, and seven. I get up eight, nine, seven. I get up 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 nine, seven. I Great things from you. Uh, you've already done it. You know, um, that humble leadership, man, uh, being an ambassador. Uh, I, I really appreciate what you're doing for this industry. I really am. I uh, really do. So uh, with that, guys, we're going to let Caleb get out of here. And uh, y'all stay tuned with us. We've got an episode a month. I uh, appreciate you listening, liking, subscribing, all the good stuff that you guys do so well. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys in future episodes. Caleb, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being with me today. It's been an honor, Mr. Houston. Thank you. You've been listening to the Better Bid Calling Podcast. If you would like to sponsor an episode, please contact us at betterbidcalling at gmail.com. Thank you.